to talk about sort of three three um, different groups of um, of areas. The first one was the the of the office experience um, for you as a GP and me as a gynae. So sort of a day in the office where you've got patients coming through and how to work out what the um, what the issues are in the in the most efficient and and simple. I've tried to really simplify this because because basically I'm a I'm a simple person, but. Um, you know, you guys have got it a lot harder than us. So you've got you, anything comes through your door. You've got a you know neurological condition. You've got an orthopedic condition, and then you might have a gynae condition. And so, you just don't know what's uh, what's confronting you next. Um, every every day for you is a puzzle, and sometimes that's a big white puzzle, very complex to to work out. So, and we're all in in it together with you to try and sort that out. But I just wanted to um to go through a few things that make the um, dissecting that a little bit easier. So it's really important that we think about when we have the patient coming through the door, the knowledge of anatomy and pathology, um, the experience and clinical exposure that, that we've all had to work these patients out, um, and then think about it in terms of epide epidemiology. So, so what diseases in those different age, age brackets are most likely to occur? Always think about the anatomy. Um, of so for gynecology, it's it's all very proximal, and you think about the relationship between the organs. So we've got, um, you know, bladder is very close to uterus, is very close to rectum, vagina, ovary. So you can um, you can think about the the presentation in terms of the pathological um, processes that are in the organs that lie next to each other, and they set the symptoms off. So laparoscopy really helps us to define that. Um, some of these movies didn't really come out, unfortunately, so I can't play this, but, but essentially normal anatomy, um, but just showing you the, the proximity of all of the, um, all of the gynae organs to other organs that then set off symptom profiles. So you've got rectus sigmoid down here, um, uterus here, ovaries, fallopian tubes, um, round ligaments, then you've got blood supply, nerve supply down here to the, to the bladder. Um, and, and setting off things such as the overactivity with pain, um, diarrhea because of the um, stimulation of the, of the rectus sigmoid with things like endometriosis. So you think about the proximity of the organs um, and that helps you with, when your patient walks through the door to just try and decipher what might be happening. Um, so how can we have that better day in the office? So we think about the age of the patient, we think about the symptom type and we think about the acuteness of their symptoms, so that's going to help us really determine, you know, is this physiology, is it pathology, how are we going to how are we going to approach it? So when that patient walks through your door, um, we, you know, first of all, age. So pre the pre menarche, um, the young reproductive years, the later reproductive and premenopausal years, perimenopause and menopause. And you think if you break it down into those brackets, you've got those those five areas which, which um, have very specific pathology um, attached to them. And, uh, and so that makes it a lot easier to, um, to really think about what's, what's happening and what their presentation is about. Um, the acuteness of that presentation. So is this someone who's come, walked through your door and has had their symptom in minutes and hours? Um, you think about physiology and ovulation events or 40, 48 to 72 hours, you think about luteal pain or follicular pain. Um, has it been a week or two, or is it is it greater than three months? Is it chronic? Um, and then for gynaecology, I think the key to it is to try and look at the relationship between pain and bleeding for most things that we see. Obviously, not all, but most things. So, if you look at the ratio of pain to bleeding, generally speaking, that's the key to working out what of these conditions: endometriosis, adenomyosis, fibroids. Um, miscarriage, fertility, ectopics, incontinence products. What, what is the, what is the um, likely process? So think about the relationship for their um, symptom and pathology. Um, when we importantly, and I've, I'll pop this on your cheat sheet, and we'll see this a few times tonight. But just um, the the pain scoring. So take a pain score from your patients. Um, it's very easy to do, dysmenorrhea, intermenstrual pain, dyspareunia, dyskesia. So just ask them to rate it zero to 10. You can do visual analog. You can just get them to put a number. Um, but essentially, if you've got three scores over five, 
um, in that group. Generally speaking, that's an 85% pickup for something such as endometriosis. It's very important to know that because that makes that makes deciphering that quite easy. Um, the other the other thing on your cheat sheet is just the bleeding rule. So so I generally ask patients um, if they um, if they use pads, tampons are both on the heaviest day. And so and and when they when they're changing on the heaviest day more than two hourly, particularly with clots, etc., you know that they're going to have a structural pathology issue nearly always and not always but nearly always and and so that's a that's a really simple thing to pick up a, a structural issue then we look at the relationship between the pain <clears throat> the, and and bleeding so the ratio so something such as endometriosis as you can see there on the left painful condition major pain very minimal bleeding um, something such as um, uh, adenomyosis, you're going to have very heavy bleeding and you've got significant pain. So there's a cross section of the of the uterus there and you can see those giant um, vascular channels. So adenomyosis is like, um, imagine sort of Swiss cheese, you've got lots of, um, of endometrial lining throughout the muscle where it shouldn't be and it communicates with the cavity. So they shower with bleeding and they've got severe pain with that at the time. You know, the uterus blows up as a, as a blue structure, a very painful structure at the time of their period and shortly before and, and, and afterwards. So that, that determines the, um, the pain profile there. If you've got fibroids, um, the thing to think about with fibroids is actually where are they? So, so different fibroids will create different symptoms. So you can have the submucose or fibroids, so the one inside the cavity. That can be, I might have just lost that there, that can be, um, that can be tiny, it can be five millimetres, <clears throat> but it can cause tremendous bleeding. You can have a giant fibroid in the intramural space that causes no symptoms apart from space occupation. And then you can have a, a, a fibroid on the outside, this sort of um, pedunculated fibroid, which torts on its pedicle there. And so that's that's extremely painful when when that when they undergo torsion. So this this was a lady that that um, actually monitored for actually years until she had difficulty breathing. So it didn't bother her <clears throat> until she she was struggling with actually breathing. But that was a very large uh, intramural structure that's um, that that didn't that didn't really present with pain or bleeding. Um, this is a um, this is a submucosal fibroid. It's it's tiny, but you can see that it's got a really rich vascular supply on the outside. Um, and these can be these can be a few millimetres or maybe a centimetre, um, and create quite significant bleeding. So um, when when they they present, the again this video is not playing that well, but you can see here we've taken the pressure off the camera, and then those those vessels those channels open up into the into the cavity, and so we've, we've um, this is hysteroscopy, release the pressure, and then and you can see those vessels sort of showering there. Um, we've removed that structure quite easily with hysteroscopy. So it can be quite an acute event, but it's very easy to treat. Um, and then you've got um, structures such as this that don't present with, <clears throat> with, with bleeding at all. So that's a fibroid that has no bleeding and lots of pain. So you think about an extra uterine, it's pedunculated, um, and it's um, so it's sitting out on its pedicle. This, this is presented with significant left-sided pain. So that's because that fibroid is, is torting as as you've seen with ovarian torsion. So really painful, very acute, um, nausea, vomiting, that type of presentation, but no bleeding history. So again, it's the balance of pain and bleeding with these, um, these cases that make, make you understand um, what the pathology is and where it might be. Um, then um, pregnancy-related bleeding. So if you, if you think about if someone is pregnant and they come into your office, um, it's very easy to work out whether they're a, a threatened incomplete complete miscarriage or whether they're a, a, an extra uterine or ectopic pregnancy by the ratio of pain and bleeding. So, so an intrauterine pregnancy, generally minimal pain, um, far heavier bleeding. An ectopic pregnancy, um, such, as, uh, such as this here on the, on the left-hand side, you've got the pregnancy in the right fallopian tube there. So it's, it's unruptured but leaking. So it's very painful as it stretches the um, the tube, and and then on the right you've got obviously a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, but lots of pain, and they may have no bleeding or just some spotting. Um, obviously, your investigation in terms of um, beta HCG is the number over fifteen hundred. 
can we see it on ultrasound? They're, they're important things. As you know, if, you, if you've got an HCG over 1500 and you can't see it on scan, um, then, then you've got to think it's an ectopic until proven otherwise. But these patients have um, classically have, you know, they're guarding, they've got peritonism, they've got cervical excitation on examination. Um, then, then in your infertility patients, so again, a patient walks through the door, they they have they've been trying to get pregnant for perhaps a year, some some sometimes less, but but often even more, even longer than a year or two, or even two years, and they're seeing you for that. So you'll run through that history and you'll just take a quick um, a quick cycle history and pain history. And so so is their bleeding normal? Is their cycle regular? Is it light? Um, it, it, do they have negative pain scores or or average you know low one to four? Um, if they if they don't if they've got severe pain or severe bleeding history if they if if on a um, cheat sheet you've got the um, the rules for pain and bleeding so if they fulfil either of those you've got to think there's some pathology going on there and that's something that's important for us to to try and fix for them to conceive naturally um, incontinence so incontinence isn't always asymptomatic so there's sometimes a pain presentation with that cystitis recurrent infections. Um, and then you've got your bleeding presentations, and that's a TCC there on the right hand side. So you've got um, you've got some unusual presentations with incontinence as well. It just just to bear in mind that just because they're incontinent doesn't just mean it's a it's a pelvic floor weakness. Um, there may be there may be something behind that. Um, and again, then with with prolapse, and this is obviously gross prolapse, but prosodentia, pain and bleeding, quite common. Um, so in that older patient with prolapse. Um, and, and it's important to us, and some people are very embarrassed about being examined or um, some of these patients actually present and they've been managing that for years and years, and, but that can, um, can present with significant um, bleeding with ulceration and pain. So think about it in, again in those age brackets. So when we think about these sort of groups of patients walking through your door, you, you, again, breaking them down into that, that the age groups and thinking about the likelihood of the pathology and that the relationship of pain and bleeding. Um, a 13 year old girl presents with a mother with history of severe prolonged menstrual loss. Uh, and again, we sent these cheat sheets out for you to, to do before the presentation, but you may not have had time for that. But so two most likely diagnoses and three tests for that 13 year old girl. Again, trying to break it down and keep it quite simple. Um, an ovulation and von Willenbrands. They're the classic sort of presentations with this group. Um, as you know, von Willenbrands is the most common um, coagulation disorder um, that, that, that will present at this stage and then anovulation. So basically the tests that we can do, just some simple screening tests, full blood count, um, the platelet function 100 assay, very easy test to organise and a progesterone. Just make sure if you're ordering your platelet function 100 that they've not had any, any, um, any inflammatories or or fish oil, et cetera, that might alter that test within the first uh, the three weeks prior to doing it. Um, progesterone test to see if they're anovulatory as well. Um, then the next group, an 18 year old girl, presents with a history of prolonged significant pelvic pain and irregular spotting. So three most likely diagnoses and three tests. So you think about endometriosis, you think about pregnancy, you think about um, pelvic inflammatory disease, and um, some tests that you would do, as, as you would all know, is a preg pregnancy test. CRP is a really useful test, um, and we do it for many of these patients for, for different presentations, but CRP, FBC, um, and an ultrasound. A reproductive age female presents with a positive pregnancy test with pain and or bleeding. So what's the most urgent examination finding in your office that day? That's gonna be guarding. Um, guarding and rebound or guarding. And that's gonna tell you whether that's, it's extra uterine or whether it's, it's more likely to be a form of miscarriage. So two most important blood tests, the FBC and a, and a preg test to know, are they stable? Sometimes ectopics can look tremendously stable, but they've got a blood count of, of, uh, of 80. Um, but you, you wanna know what their blood count is and also what their quant is so that if we're sending them off for that last important test, which is the ultrasound, we can determine should have we seen that pregnancy in the uterus. So if the beta-HCG is, is 100, well, we wouldn't see it in the uterus. So we're not 
too concerned if they're symptomatically well and if they've got a nice soft uh, non-tender abdomen. But if they've got a beta HCG of 3,000 um, and and unless you think they've had a complete miscarriage, well, an empty uterus on ultrasound and a 3,000 HCG, as you know, tells us that that's got to be an ectopic um, unless, unless they've had a complete miscarriage, but that will be obvious remembering that relationship between bleeding and pain. The complete miscarriage has a has a very um, rapid onset, heavy pain episode, and then and uh, and then um, loss of pregnancy with heavy bleeding and minimal pain um, by the end of that. And when they're seeing you, they're going to have no pain probably, but the ectopic will be the opposite to that. Um, so get that ultrasound, and and that's important. And then that and that's that's then maybe a call to um, to your specialist to say, okay, I think I've got this this patient. They may have an ectopic. Um, and we can always fast track people through emergency departments, et cetera. So we want to get onto those diagnoses very quickly because they're the important ones not to miss. Um, 25 to 40 year old woman presents with a three month history of episodic severe pelvic pain, nausea and presyncope, um, HCG negative. So your, your three most likely uterine diagnoses and tests, um, endometriosis in the, in, in the version of adenomyosis, um, a tubo ovarian abscess or PID, and a tubo ovarian or fibroid torsion. And you saw those pathologies, but just think about those in terms of that age group and how they're presenting in the office. Do your blood count, CRP and an ultrasound, and then you're going to pretty much get your diagnosis. Um, 45 to 55 year old woman presents with pelvic pain, two most likely uterine diagnosis in that age bracket. Again, remember, we're looking at these in age sectors, adenomyosis and fibroids. 30 to 55 year old woman presents with protracted heavy bleeding, three most likely diagnoses and tests, submucosal fibroid, adenomyosis, anovulation. Um, do your blood count, progesterone to look for anovulation, ultrasound to assess for those features. And remember, important to do an ultrasound in a, in a centre that, um, that is very good at looking at submucosal fibroids. Um, and adenomyosis and maybe ask that question, tell them what you're thinking so that they specifically will, uh, will look for that. 48-year-old um, woman presents with acute urinary retention. So what's the most common uterine cause in that group? Well, remember when they're sort of peaking and troughing with, with variation in, um, in hormone production, um, something that is quite common is a, um, a cause of retention in that group is an anterior fibroid of, uh, of greater than seven centimetres. Um, a 70-year-old lady presents with acute urinary retention. Think about um, the uterine causes in this of uh, acute or chronic retention. So prolapse with urethropocycle kinking. Um, so think about the, um, the process in that group. So you've got the diagram on the left with good support, diagram on the right. And as prolapse proceeds, there's is sort of compression and kinking of the urethra and compression of, of the bladder and, and also the bowel. And there may be a uterus present or there may not be, but retention can occur in both groups. Um, a 70 year old lady presents with vaginal bleeding. Again, think about the three most, most likely diagnoses in that group to investigation. So you've got infection, atrophy and prolapse and hyperplasia and carcinoma. So never forget the last important group, but also remember that the first groups, uh, infection, atrophy and prolapse, they, they most commonly create the bleeding issue. But, but if, they have an, if they have a uterus, they do need an ultrasound because we can't assume, even if we see some um, pressure changes at prolapse, we've all seen prolapse cases with uh, endometrial cancer as well. So it's important to do your internal exam, but it's important to do your ultrasound. Um, then just endometriosis, looking at that, that, just a, a, that in a sort of a subgroup, and just wanting you to pull out a few things <clears throat> from that. So to just understand the probability of endometriosis in all cases of chronic pelvic pain, um, know the pain rule that we've got on your cheat sheet there. So just remember, ask those four questions. Greater than five, you'll pick it up um, quite easily. And then understand some early and simple treatment options for it. So endo and chronic pelvic pain. So the most um, common cause of pelvic pain in females is in the reproductive age group is of a gynecological nature. So that's important. Just remember that stat. So 70%. So you've got a, a, a person come to your office, even if you were to um, to uh, to be you know guessing if you're not sure, seven out of 10 times you're going to be right with a gynecological cause. 
The most common cause of, of gynecological pelvic pain, uh, remember this is physiology, so the reproductive cycle. Remember it's got all those explosive events um, that, uh, that occur over the cycle. So ovulation, luteal, um, menstruation. Now chronic pelvic pain, however, is um, so pain from belly button to the knee. <clears throat> if it has a history of um, a, of over three months duration, it's 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 chronic, and it's it's not related to the reproductive cycle. So that's so it's really ever relating to the uh, to the reproductive cycle. So just remember, once you get down that that timeline of duration, you start to pick up pathology rather than physiology. So there's lots of causes for chronic pelvic pain, um, gynae, gastro, urological, musculoskeletal, myofascial, psychological and combinations of. Um, we've got extra uterine causes in gynae, such as that group endo, PID, pelvic congestion, adnexal cysts. We've got intrauterine causes, adenomyosis, primary dysmenorrhea, cervical stenosis, cavity polyps, fibroids, pelvic floor relaxation, gastro causes. I put irritable bowel syndrome in double inverted commas because I just want everyone to remember that in that young age group, so in that reproductive age group, most IBS relates to focal pathology such as endometriosis. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not normally a primary bowel diagnosis as such, although they can have correlation. But just remember to think about that: um, urological causes, musculoskeletal, myofascial abdominal wall. Um, you know, the contraction not with dysfunctional motor end plates. So we, we see that a little bit and we do use trigger point injections for that, um, for that group of patients. But it's very specific and you can actually very much localise it. Um, so 70% of, uh, of, of pain relates to a gynec cause. There's the breakdown there in the other groups. But 56% um, of all cases are due to endometriosis. So remember, it's just, it's just about thinking about it. Um, which everyone's doing now, but maybe 10 years ago it was less less uh, less of a case. You know what endometriosis is, it's ectopic endometrial glands and stroma, um, and it's located outside of the uterus and it grows in areas such as, you know, around ovaries, bowel areas, up around bladder, giving bladder pain, uh, even up around above the liver, and implants in the pericardium, giving, giving um, chest discomfort on respiration, um, growing around the bowel areas. So, giving that defecation pain. So as the, particularly at, at period time when those implants are active, um, it, it stimulates activity in the uh, in the rectum and creates that wave of, um, of dyskesia that our patients commonly, you're, you're commonly seeing those. Um, just diagnose, just remember, dysmenorrhea, intermenstrual pain, dyspareunia, dyskesia. Um, just ask those four questions. Now, you may or may not perform the specific vaginal exam. It's it's very simple and essentially it's just a very gentle exam but between the um, behind the cervix and you're sweeping across at the back in, in the cul de sac and you'll notice whether they've got some contraction, um, scarring, um, irregularity, or whether it's smooth and symmetrical. And that's important. But but if if you if you're not doing that, you just ask those four questions and you're going to pretty much um, come up with an understanding of is does this patient it, do, it, are they likely to have endometriosis or are they or are they not likely to? Um, so pliability in the exam, um, the pain, the discomfort is duplicated by physical exam. Remember that investigations. So it's pretty simple. We don't have to get um, down the realm of MRIs and, and 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 other testings, but but ultrasound we can see ovarian disease. We can see severe rectovaginal disease. Um, and we can see adenomyosis. So that's going to just confirm your diagnosis. So if you send off your patient, you see that sort of ground glass um, appearance there of the ovary or, or the report that tells you that there's an endometrioma, well, you, you've nailed that. So you've got the diagnosis. Now, why do we why do we treat endometriosis? Well, obviously for severe pain, we want to have uh, our patients um, happy and comfortable and without pain in the simplest possible way. Fertility, so are they trying to conceive at the moment and are they unable to conceive and did you pick up the fact that they might have endometriosis with your, your pain scoring? Um, and then there's that question over increased ovarian cancer risk in um, very long-term endometriomas which are, which are not treated. Um, so it's, it's, they're, they're the reasons why we, why we want to treat, but you want to convert the condition to the quiet state or you want to remove the disease. And, and four-pronged approach, just again, simplifying this, but 
but um, the first three are very easy for you to do for your patient um, and just to step through it. And, and obviously we always, um, we always step through the easiest managements in all patients, but particularly with the very young, we very rarely ever want to jump into surgery, um, even if we're asked early on, which we often are. So you, you do the comfort non-medical things, I call them first up. Um, then anti-inflammatories, hormone manipulation, and then surgical resection if, if it's required. Um, importantly, no, not ablative therapy, but resection surgery. As, as pretty much everyone knows now, the gold standard for, for treatment of endometriosis is removal, not, 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 not diathermy. Um, primary treatment, so some comfort things, very simple. Find yourself a good physio that you've got good, that you know that works with, um, with female pelvic health, works well with them um, and, and develop a relationship so that you can send your patients there and, and have a bit of a dialogue with them. Um, in terms of exercise, there's very good data that says that you get your patient exercising um, three times a week for 30 minutes with a, a heart rate at about 80% max, and that has a very positive influence on decreasing pain scores, um, maybe as much as, as some, uh, some analgesics. Um, Magnesium treatment can be very helpful from a bowel and from an adenomyosis point of view. So that's something very simple to, to treat with, 1,000 milligrams daily magnesium, um, often at night, also good for sleep patterns. So, so that's it's simple to start patients on um, appearance and hydration. So you want to decrease the volume of stretch inside the patient is how I explain it. So, so if they've got endometriosis over their rectum, you want to decrease the stretch pain and by just emptying out and being regular, that can be a very simple thing to do to keep them comfortable. Um, primary treatments with anti-inflammatory drugs, you want to um, you want to combine paracetamol with non because remember it potentiates the effect and you want to use a regular schedule rather than PRN and then add medication on top of that if needed. Um, Hormonal manipulation, again, you all know this, but your progestogens, your combined pill, um, GnRH, probably not, it wouldn't be something that you might start up, but the first two groups and working through carefully, deciding what your patient needs. Do they have migraine that's set off with estrogen? Do they have uh, migraine with aura, so progestogens only? Um, or can we use a combined pill, which may have a, a, a balanced effect on things such as skin, hair growth, mood, sometimes appetite, et cetera. So think about the pills, side effects, and the range of, of, um, of options that we've got to start those patients on. Um, the, um, and we want to just decidualize the implants, get them in a hypoestrogenic state. And then you want to, you generally want to review these patients at about four months once you've commenced to management to see that it's effective. And then if they need it, um, then they need to be referred for, for laparoscopy. And resect, remember resection, you can't diathermy around the uterine artery or the ureter or the rectum. You need to have, um, have resection management rather than ablation. So just remember, make sure that your patients are, are having the correct treatments. Um, and I'll just scroll through this if I can. So in, in summary, just think about a gynae cause and chronic pelvic pain, 70% um, of total cases. Think about endometriosis as a cause 56% of all cases of chronic pelvic pain. Remember that pain scoring and your three scores over five, so important and it is on your cheat sheet. Um, and um, and that's, you're gonna pick up most of those, um, those conditions. So remember when they walk through your office, um, pain scoring and your, your bleeding profile as well, just to try and work out what the pathology is. And then just lastly, I, I just wanted to, just a, a couple of, um, of, of issues surrounding prolapse and incontinence. So just in terms of the learning outcomes, we wanted, um, we wanted you to um, just understand basically through the three main prolapse groups that come through your office, and I, I'm sure you're, you're, all, um, you're all well across this. How do we test if we have the correct diagnosis? So, so is the prolapse actually causing my symptoms? Or are these patients just you know, they have they had three children and they have some products, but they've got something that's completely unrelated. Um, understand early simple treatment options and activities to avoid. So you really want to you, you want to help your patient when they walk through the door, um, understand what their problem is, and then be able to manage it in the simplest fashion. Um, so anterior exam. So as you know, you 
you'll put in a, a half a duck bill or you'll break your disposable plastic speculum in half and you'll just support the posterior area to look at the anterior area. Now, you, you can get them standing or at 45 degrees as well, but if you're lying them down, you can do this examination quite simply and you get them to cough and strain and you see, you could, do they have a sister cell? Do they have a bulge? Is there incontinence at the time of coughing? Um, and, um, and then you can see how supported that anatomy is. Posterior rectus seal, again, you're supporting the front with your speculum. So, and you, you do the same set of maneuvers and you get them to strain and cough. And you can see whether they've got a bulge that is progressive and coming down or, or is, it, is it fairly stable? Remember, sometimes if you're seeing people that had um, childbirth, they, they may have pelvic floor laxity, but they may not have a prolapse issue as such. So it's important to, to define the differences and, and to see enough so that you'll know what is normal and how you can reassure your patients. Sometimes they just need to know that things are normal, um, especially in this day and age. Um, is the cervix presenting at the introitus? So that's a uterine prolapse. It, the uterus is telescoped all the way down and the cervix is on presentation. And so it's very easy to see that that patient does have significant prolapse, but sometimes those things are very, very easy to to fix in the office with things such as support rings. So, and then you've got prosodenture and that, that will always benefit from at least immediate restoration and, and estrogenization. Um, and it's, 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 it's interesting, and I'll just take that off the screen so it's not too, too uh, troublesome, but it's interesting how, um, how many people actually have that particular degree of prolapse and hide it for a long period of time um, and manage it. So it's important just to ask the patient and often examine. I've seen a lot of patients with prostate that, that have come um, without examination because they've been too embarrassed to when they're speaking to their GP to um, to uh, to discuss that that symptom and they've just requested um, referral. So what is your patient's symptom when they come in with prolapse? So it's important to because um, some patients will just be picked up with prolapse or a degree of pelvic floor laxity just at the time of a checkup or a pap smear and and that's that's the time when it's you know they don't really necessarily need anything and probably we we shouldn't be recommending anything except some some um, health and lifestyle treatments. But so what's the patient's symptom, not the sign? That's really important. Um, what does your patient want from treatment? So if they're going, if they come to you and they think that they've got products, they've got some symptoms. What what do they want you to fix for them? Um, are they motivated to avoid surgery? So that's really important to um, to think about because if you've got a motivated patient, you're far more likely to um, to to be able to move them through some non-surgical options. Um, and there, is there a risk if they do or if they don't have surgery? So so there are, you know, rarely is rarely is prolapse life-threatening, but it can, you know, if you've got ulceration and infection or if you've got if you've got retention um, and and recurrent significant UTIs, well, there, there can be issues there. So you just have to think about is you know what what do they need, what do they want, um, and what are the risks of, of not doing anything. So you know in their lifestyle, are they you know are they out in the garden like a lot of our patients are, especially at the moment with COVID. You know they love getting out there and they love going to Bunnings and they love getting 25 kilogram bags of, of soil and carrying it you know up a few flights of stairs into their house and just do some gardening or, or potting on their verandas. So just have to think about what, what are they doing in their lifestyle? Are they, uh, are they weightlifting? Are they doing things which are promoting prolapse? So you, you have a chat to them and, and you try and modify their lifestyle um, so that they can actually make improvements without doing much more than just changing some of their behavioral patterns. So, you know, this, this lady's going to break down the soil volume. She's going to get the pot with, uh, with, with you know, 500 grams instead of um, 25 kilograms. And maybe we're going to think about just changing the way we do weights at the gym. Um, I, I put this in because this is one of the biggest prolapse generating exercises that we have. So, so the kettlebell squats, and you can see them everywhere because the personal trainers do a you know, a few um, a few weekends of online to, to get certified, but they're not thinking about the age brackets and the safety of our women, particularly from, you know, the mid-40s or post-childbearing um, through into the sort of 60s. So they're doing these exercises um, quite strenuously and, and they are generating pathology. So it's important to, 
to think about um, um, how to how to avoid how to do exercise um, and the lifestyle things that we want to do without generating prolapse. Now, simple things that you can do, and you've all seen these these sorts of um, positional changes on if patients are having say difficulty evacuating bowel because of prolapse because of a rectus seal. Well, you can just change the angulation. These things are really cheap. Um, but it can be, uh, you know, major in um, in allowing them to um, to defecate much more easily without actually any any intervention at all. Apart from that, uh, physiotherapy is, is really essential. And, it's, and you send your patient to uh, the physio that we talked about early on for um, for for therapy that's going to avoid them needing an intervention. And and it doesn't always work. But there's certainly good data that shows that if your patients need surgery, they will do better after uh, after. Uh, physiotherapy so w whether it be continence or um, you know learning functional bracing if they're going to have a prolapse in a reconstruction um, so in the first eight weeks if they have a cough laugh a sneeze they can they can contract beforehand so just just activating the um, pelvic floor contraction reflex might be important for physio but seeing if they can avoid surgery by actually by actually conducting physio um, and another another simple thing to do, and in most groups, it's always important to run some um, estrogenization of the vagina. So, really simple, low risk. If you look at the data on um, on on uh, on obesity and and um, and, uh, and the risk of cancer, in fact, the vaginal the vaginal uh, estradiol patients um, had uh, had a lower cancer risk than than um, the patients that weren't using anything in the hormone and, and breast cancer. Um, Trial. So you've got, to, you've got to think that this three times a week, a tiny amount of obestin, very, very safe. Um, and you've got you reassure your patient about that. But but they're specifically for recurrent UTIs, um, vaginal atrophy, dyspareunia related to um, age-related change in tissues. This is just a simple thing to do. And for prolapse, uh, even if they need reconstruction or ring support, that can be very important in preparing the, the tissues. Um, Non-surgical support. Just to mention this, so we we you know we see lots of patients that either can't have surgery or don't want to have surgery or need to get through a moment in time. So it's important to remember ring ring pastries. You know they've they've sort of gone out of fashion in some areas, but it's very important. And a lot of patients have um, have an immediate uh, great quality of life improvement when you pop one of these in um, and size them properly and fit them properly. And, um, and for the patients, whether it be temporary or permanent, it can be a great option for them. Um, so remember, it's a non-surgical support. And, and I like to use this sometimes as, as even a trial of cure. So if a patient comes in and they think that they've got symptoms that are going to disappear with the surgery and they really want one, um, and if you're not sure that that's the answer for them, I just say to them, look, let's, let's pop this in. Let's check, check out the pelvic floor support. Let's see you in two weeks and tell me how you feel. Um, so do they feel better? Uh, a trial of theory. So, so again, was it the cause? Was was their pain related to their prolapse? Because often the two are not related. Um, and is it in a, a moment in time fixed for them? So have they had? We've seen patients that have had their first child and have had severe prolapse. Some some with even prosodentia that we've seen and. Um, and they need support without surgery because they want to have more more children. And, and so the last thing we want to do is a a complex set of surgeries where they're going to um, to break those supports. So you might need to get them through that moment in time. Or or someone who is 60 and has prolapse and is going to be looking after a grandchild for the next year um, and lifting quite a lot in a you know a, a toddler. So you you want to. You don't want to necessarily offer surgery if you know that, that they're going to have a high chance of recurrence and maybe you can just get through a year or two years um, with something simple before they have the reconstruction because you only want to really do that once. And some patients will try the, the rings and then they'll go, actually, I really like it. It's a long-term option. So it's important just to offer it, discuss it, and um, and then look at uh, surgery if, if it's required. Um, just just Hi, to mention. So we only have five minutes left and we have a few questions yeah. that have come through. Um, did you have anything you wanted to quickly wrap up before we yeah. move to questions? Yeah, let me wrap very quickly. So just non-mesh non repairs. Um, everyone knows about me mesh has been a big issue um, worldwide. So it's important to think about your non-mesh repairs for prolapse. Um, this, the, again, a video that hasn't come out, but, but laparoscopic vaginal reconstruction, um, non-mesh continence repairs. Again, the tapes are... Are very they're, they're not in the mesh um, complication group but 
but there are we're we're increasingly being asked for to go back to our our um, non mesh or non tape options for continence um, and um, so suture repair of bladder neck laparoscopically. So they're things which which patients may may wish to do. But just simple conclusions um, out of all of this talk. Remember the anatomy. Remember age and pathology. Um, bleeding and pain pathology type and location, bleeding and pain rules, which you've got in your cheat sheet, very simple way to approach pathology. Um, exhaust the safest options first, and then communicate actively and freely with your specialists like us. So we, we love a chat. So um, yeah, and speaking of chats, so you've got some questions there maybe? Yes, um, so one doctor has said that they remember being taught once upon a time that uh, adenomyosis can only be diagnosed on histology and not ultrasound. Has, it, has the thinking changed about this or do you still rely mainly on history with examination? Yeah, that's that's a good question and that's, uh, that's very true. So, so there was, so I guess 15 to 20 years ago, um, it was only ever a diagnosis made in in the specimen in the lab. So, so that um, in, in terms of diagnosing endomyosis, so now we're we're great with ultrasound. There are a few centres that are, are particularly very good um, in Sydney, and then MRI is a very good um, modality if we need to determine the difference between, say, ad severe endomyosis and sarcoma. But, but no, ultrasound, if you ask for it, if you're thinking about adenomyosis, ask them about it. But also remember, really heavy bleeding, severe pain is more likely to be adeno than endo. Great. Next question is, can vaginal estrogen cause bleeding in postmenopausal women when given for an optimal sample for pap smear? No. Uh, do you mean, so I guess they're, they're, they're wondering if it can sort of uh, be over, overly reactive with the endometrium and create endometrial bleeding. The, if you're using it in the, in, the, in the dosage that we normally do, so I don't use, I know they say daily for two weeks. I, I normally use it three times a week for two weeks or three weeks um, and, and I've not seen any, any bleeding issues and I don't think that that's going to generate any endometrial change. And it's un it's unlikely, even if they've got any erosive change in the in the vagina, to create. It's more likely to heal those. Like we'll use ovestin for for um, tape erosions and mesh erosions in in a simple treatment. So it it sort of zips it up it, rather than the opposite. Great. The next question is: What is the endometrial thickness you would accept in women who are on higher doses of HRT for difficult flushes and no bleeding symptoms? Mm, that's a good question. Um, when they say high doses, I think you want to make sure that they're on appropriate doses and that they've got progestogenic protection. So if they've, if they've got adequate progestogenic protection, um, we look, we still like to see endometrium five to six millimetres, but with, with high doses of HRT, you're going to see levels of, of eight to 10. Now, in an absence of symptoms and in an, in an absence, so no bleeding, um, stable lining, you, you, you will re-look at that, but you don't need a, to necessarily biopsy um, a patient on HRT with a lining of eight millimetres. But uh, I think ideally, yeah. six. So the next question is, what features on history, exam and or investigations would make you think of pelvic congestion syndrome and what are some management options for this? All right, so I love that question because pelvic congestion syndrome is 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 like a unicorn. So it doesn't it, it's not really often a disease on its own. It's it's um and but it's more talked about because there are um, in the in the seventies someone called Bard developed a criteria for it and very rarely do do any um do any patients meet the true criteria for pelvic congestion syndrome in, in the sense of vascular dilatation? So, so most of the time it's other pathologies, and and I would say most of the pathologies that I've been referred with with pelvic congestion syndrome that have not responded to coiling and embolizing, they've had endometriosis. So I think it's important to be a little bit skeptical, but sometimes you can see severe pelvic re uh, relaxation and then you'll see the de by definition you've got to see the, uh, the 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 venous measurements 
uh, meet that criteria and, and, it, and it, it's quite obvious um, it, it, if they do meet that. And I would say I've seen maybe a half a dozen cases in, in my career of true pelvic congestion syndrome. Hi everyone. So um, my name's Hamish Urquhart and I'm one of the colorectal surgeons here at St Vincent's. And so what I'll be talking about is not only just female incontinence, that'll be a big focus, but also just male incontinence as well, so incorporating um, uh, the condition in uh, both sexes. So a little bit about the talk, what I'll be first talking about is just a little bit about myself, but then firstly just focusing on the condition, the etiology, the, all the different causations, and just some simple ways to try to differentiate the causes of incontinence. Um, following on from that, I'll go through the different investigations uh, that often I'll be the one who completes, just to go so you know uh, what's done so patients have an expectation of the different tests that will be completed. Um, and then I'll go through the different treatment options, obviously starting with the very simple and then going through all the different surgical options. Um, I'll go through a bit about the results, just the success rates, and then just some suggestions uh, that I have for yourselves. So, with the learning outcomes from today, so we're supposed to basically cover what's the relevant history and exam and incontinence, um, how to develop a care plan for bowel incontinence, and then just to go through the eligibility for sacral nerve stimulation, which to me, especially lately, is becoming a game changer. And although it's a fairly major it's a procedure, um, the outcomes are really quite promising. Um, so just a little bit about uh, myself. So I'm one of the colorectal surgeons here at St Vincent's Public and the Privates. Um, I did all my general surgical training in Sydney um, up until 2015. And I've done four post-fellowship years. So two of these uh, focused on colorectal cancer uh, and inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and I spent two years essentially focusing on pelvic floor disease with a big focus on fecal incontinence and other proctology conditions. So just a little bit, just as an introduction about what is fecal incontinence. And it's a real broad term that basically just means it's the involuntary loss of flatus, uh, stool, um, that can either be a liquid or a solid stool. And it's uh, often accompanied by anal seepage. And that's the main, uh, a big thing a lot of patients complain of, that being that there's uh, soiling of the underwear without necessarily having that large emotion. And it, it's a debilitating, and, and I can't stress it enough how, how devastating it can be physically, uh, mentally, uh, from a psychosocial standpoint, uh, financially as well. Um, and the incidence is a lot uh, it's more common than a lot of people expect. And so it really ranges depending on how the studies look at this sort of thing. It's anywhere between about one and 90, or one and 20%. Um, but it's pretty difficult to determine how common the condition is because uh, so many people will have the condition but not report it or they don't seek medical attention. And some of the studies will quote about 70% of people who have incontinence won't report it. So it's a bit difficult to work out how prevalent it is, but it is incredibly prevalent. And I guess it's really important to comment that uh, faecal incontinence is the symptom, not the diagnosis. So the, the, the diagnosis or the pathology um, is what we'll sort of go through uh, today. So just a little bit about just how prevalent the problem is. So this was a study in 2002 and it looked at just under 16,000 people. Now these patients were all over the age of 40 and they excluded nursing home patients. So you're not talking about the elderly with major medical comorbidities. These are people functioning um, in the community. And 1.4% of patients uh, suffered fecal incontinence. It's interesting that the males were equal to females. And I know we're focusing a bit on females today, um, but uh, age was directly linked with worse quality of life being that the older you are, uh, the worse the quality of uh, life uh, with the incontinence. Uh, this next study, which is really sort of, yeah, was fairly influential, sort of showed that the prevalence can be much higher though. So, I mean, this was a systematic review and it, looked, it saw that rate of about one to 20% was the rate of incontinence. But this is what was interesting. If you define incontinence as you will be incontinent of either a liquid or a solid bowel motion at least once a month, it's about 10% of the population experience this. Um, the other thing that's Pretty interesting, especially when you're considering uh, taking histories and whatnot. In this systematic review, if you look at uh, patients who have a face-to-face -face interaction versus those who can answer questions anonymously, the face-to-face -face incidence yeah, is a lot lower than if someone can report it anonymously, which just shows you the stigma that's associated with fecal incontinence. A lot of people just don't want to talk about it or don't want to volunteer their symptoms. 
And so if you look at uh, why 70% of patients, which is you know, a pretty high rate, don't seek help, uh, one of the big problems is there's a big uh, um, pressure for sort of these Band-Aid solutions that being just to either put up with it um, or to wear pads. Um, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions in the community. Um, so for example, it's just some people advocated, it's just as you get older, it's just part and parcel of getting older, which is I think we need to sort of change that mindset because there are so many treatment options. Um, and the other thing is a lot of the magazines you'll see will sort of try to really normalise it, which I think is good. So people, it's getting rid of that stigma, but if the more it's normalised, the more people just put up with incontinence and there's that big social uh, stigma. Um, and just, not, this is not going to be a talk just for the studies, by the way, but uh, this study I just found fairly interesting. This is an Australian study done in Sydney. It just looked at the cost to people when they are incontinent. Uh, it's pretty interesting. So I looked at 100 patients, uh, the average age is about 70. Just looking at how expensive is it to pay for toiletries, pads, wipes, gastrostop, if that's what they're using. Occasionally they'll be seeing physio. And the, the average yearly cost is about $430 for the patient, and the government cost is about $530. So um, obviously it's uh, there's a fairly significant uh, burden. So what I want to talk about now is just a bit about the etiology. Uh, a bit of a way just to break up the different causes and then we'll go through the treatment. So the continence from a bowel point of view, it really involves this coordinated interplay. And I think this is a really good list because this, this is uh, in terms of the etiology. So the first thing is stool consistency. So a more liquid stool is harder for the bowel to hold onto uh, compared to a solid stool. So if, if there's a looser stool that will predispose someone to incontinence, <clears throat> Rectal capacity is the ability of the rectum to hold or store the bowel motion. So if people have a compromised rectal capacity, so say they've got scarring or they've had pelvic um, irradiation or they've had a procedure, say, where they've had a rectal resection, they're far more predisposed to then incontinence because the rectal capacity is reduced. Uh, you need to have the intact neural pathways. So any uh, nerve issues, whether it be something from MS uh, to peripheral nerve issues or spinal issues, will then obviously have a, a major effect. Um, and then there's the actual physical mechanical function. So anal sphincter function is required. So anything that compromises this, whether it be um, a attenuation that happens with a childbirth um, to a, a tear completely uh, uh, in the sphincter, um, and then pelvic floor. So the sphincter just lies below the pelvic floor. And if there's a weakness of that pelvic floor musculature, that interplays with the sphincter. And so the whole uh, mechanism is, is uh, compromised. And what I find when I'm seeing patients is there's often there's a multifactorial component. It's not typically just one, there'll be multiple factors that are contributing, to, contributing towards the etiology. So if I think, if fecal incontinence in terms of that etiology, the simplest way is when I'm assessing someone, it's either that they have a full rectum, being that they've got a big um, uh, 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 fecal material that's filling up the rectum and it's causing incontinence, or they've got an empty rectum. And so the people with the full rectum, they're essentially having overflow incontinence is a common thing, or they'll have other issues relating to the pelvic floor. So if after correcting the full rectum, so if evacuating large bowel motion or giving them enemas or helping it just get rid of the full rectum, if that helps with the fecal incontinence, um, then typically the simple causes are that it's either constipation, so the patient's got a constipated bowel uh, motions, they have pelvic floor disease or they have rectal prolapse. And with the pelvic floor disease, the condition I'm referring to is say obstructive defecation syndrome, uh, which is where there's the inability to properly evacuate the bowels because either the bowel is internally intersuscepting um, or it's just not properly squeezing out. As it squeezes out, it actually tries a, a one-way valve type thing develops uh, that prevents the bowels from evacuating. Um, uh, then if the evacuation um, doesn't help to correct the incontinence, then essentially we're dealing with an empty rectum incontinence. And this is the more st classical way people think of it. And so the first thing is if, if they've got an empty rectum but they're incontinent, either that it's diarrhea, so it's simply either colitis or proctitis, ulcerative colitis, any of those inflammatory conditions, or say they've got gastroenteritis and there's just an infective cause, or there's a sphincter insufficiency. And broadly speaking, this is that either there's been a traumatic event either a say, full thickness tear during pregnancy, or it's just a prolonged labour, and we'll go through this in a little bit, or there's a neurological issue that's causing sphincter insufficiency. 
And then with the incontinence, again, with the empty rectum, otherwise there's rectal condition. So we're talking about an empty rectum, meaning there's not a bowel motion, but say there's a, a rectal mass um, or any other col uh, colorectal cancers, for example. And so that's a very broad way of just trying to work out that, that which I'll go through when I'm trying to determine the cause of the incontinence. And so just uh, a little bit, so I'm just going to blow my notes here. So just a little bit about uh, fecal incontinence and sphincter deficiency. So this is by far and large the most common cause, um, uh, especially when you're in the context of uh, childbirth. And so if you look at patients who have, a, as I classically say, a normal vaginal delivery, that being that it's, there's not a protracted labour, there's not a forceps delivery, about 11% of patients will have some type of attenuation to their sphincter. Um, and then even if you just do an endoanal ultrasound on all patients who've had a vaginal delivery, about 30%, so one in three, will have some disruption to the fibres. So if to that you add a complex delivery, either that there's a recognised tear, an unrecognised tear that's determined later on, um, or a protracted labour, forceps delivery, a vacuum assist, all of these then increase um, the risk of developing a sphincter deficiency. And the unusual thing with this is that the symptoms of incontinence, they may develop immediately, and we're often involved if there's been a traumatic delivery to repair things, or it's something that can de develop years and years down the line. And so we see some patients, they have had their deliveries that seem fairly um, straightforward or maybe just slightly protracted and they won't develop incontinence for say 30 years. And again, I'm, I'm gonna go through this, the treatment for all these down there in a moment. Um, the other uh, reasons to develop to deficiency um, uh, is sort of related to colorectal surgery, that being uh, patients who've either had a sphincterotomy uh, for fissions Patients who've had Botox officials, and classically that's for short term, so there'd be a three month period of incontinence, but uh, that's obviously affecting the sphincter and therefore they can develop incontinence. Um, patients who've had a hemorrhoidectomy, an actual formal hemorrhoid resection, um, if any part of the sphincter is involved, they'll develop sphincter deficiency. Um, and any surgery for fistulas, so either surgeries to deal with the fistulas by placing drainage devices or just draining the fistula or cutting out the fistula. So all of that can compromise the sphincter. I guess from all this, it's just any inflammatory change um, to, the, to the sphincter or to the pelvis can cause a sphincter deficiency and then that results in incontinence. Other causes for sphincter deficiency well, are either a rectal or an anal lesion, so just the different neoplastic or cancerous processes of the rectum or the anus. Um, trauma, and that can be either direct trauma to the sphincter or then a secondary type trauma, so for example, someone who develops a pelvic fracture, and then the neurological deficits, uh, which I was talking about earlier. So, in terms of what's relevant from a history and then an exam and an initial investigation, um, uh, this is a pretty busy slide. I guess the main thing is, the, the first point is just to bring it up. And I, to me, that's the simplest thing of asking, do you suffer incontinence? <clears throat> when did it start and is it worsening? Is I think the main thing that's required. The, the, what I've got here and what I'll go through is a fairly complex history taking, but it's just not practical when you're seeing patients in your rooms um, uh, as a GP. You did the time to take a full extensive history, it's just not practical. Um, if I see someone for a, a, an incontinence review, I'll often have an hour allocated just because I've got one do the history, but then I'll do the endoanal ultrasound, the manometry, and it really takes a long time. So to me, just asking if it's present is enough to really sort of seek more help. But to go through the detail of what's relevant, I think the easiest thing is that, and I've, I've sent a PDF that you can give patients, it's ask patients to fill out a three week stool hist uh, diary or stool history. And essentially for every day, it's got how many motions, the consistency of the motions, if there was incontinence to gas, to a, a solid motion, did they have to change um, their lifestyle? And you can sort of see, it's just something you'd give the patient and then they come and bring that back 21 days later. And that's a really good validated way of trying to work out how severe the incontinence is. Um, the questions I go through, and it's a very computerized type system is, this is this uh, list here, it's called, it's a St. Mark's classification of incontinence. And it really just stratifies how bad someone's incontinence is. And it comes from St. Mark's in the UK. And essentially I ask patients, 
um, how often do they add in content of a solid stool feed? They're ne never, rarely, sometimes weekly or daily, and they get a rare score. I do the same for a liquid stool, incontinence of gas, and then alterations in the lifestyle. And at the bottom, you can see I then ask them if they need to wear a pads or a plug. Plugs aren't, um, the pads are just simple pads, and there are all the different types available from the pharmacy. Plugs are devices that are inserted into the anus, and they can be either inflated. Um, or they can be twisted to increase the size and essentially they just plug up the anal canal so someone doesn't pass uh, the motion. And they're not really as well tolerated, they can be a little bit uncomfortable. And they, like, they are more commonly used in the UK, but that's another thing um, just to ask patients because some people here still do use them. And then we also want to know if they're taking loperamide or constipating agents, um, or, and this is a big one, if they're unable to defer defecating for 15 minutes. So based on that, they get a score which really just tries to stratify and it's a really good objective way to determine how bad the incontinence is. Most of the studies and um, times where so I'm placing a sacral nerve stimulator, the score would be around the 12 to 14 mark. But it, I mean, it, this is just so that we can stratify. Someone may really have a bad time and they've got a score of eight um, and someone may be tolerating or managing the community and the score is far higher. So, but it's just a way of sort of giving a number value. Then from the other history and um, the really relevant ones are one, the number of pregnancies, the motor deliveries, so uh, the vaginal deliveries, the birth weight, uh, the type of presentation of that delivery, also if it's an emergency and it's an, um, um, uh, sorry, not emergency, sorry, uh, if, if, there's, if it's done as, uh, through the uh, hospital um, or if it's done at home, um, and then also if there's a complex delivery, so forceps, a prolonged delivery, if there's tears, um, and then if they've had that, if they've had to have a repair done. We also then want to know if they've had any pelvic or anal uh, sur uh, surgery, and that can involve like the hemorrhoids, the fissures, the fissures I mentioned earlier. And then if there's a history of urinary symptoms, and that's just because if there is a perineal descent or a loss of the pelvic floor musculature, often there'll be issues with the urinary tract. Um, the, the treatment that we do for the fecal incontinence can often assist with the urinary symptoms, but it just gives us some guidance for if it's just a general weakening globally of the pelvic floor. And then we want to know <clears throat> yeah, the diet, obviously, medications, alcohol, all things that contribute just to bowel function because that can affect continence. So for exam, in the context of incontinence, um, and again, th this is ideal for me when I have the ability to spend quite a lot of time with patients, but there's obviously an abbreviated a one done, um, essentially an abdominal exam just to make sure there are no masses. From a perianal exam, I, I could spend 20 minutes doing a perianal exam. There's so many things that come into it and that are relevant. This is sort of like the, the highlights, I guess. Um, one is the perianal skin. So what I'm looking for are scars, if there's any traumatic changes. And the skin changes is a big one. And so that excoriation can be really a good sign of long-term seepage. And so that's redness, inflammation, feels hot, almost like cellulitic. Um, often they can be staining and it's a dark, slightly darker colour. And that's just a, a real um, common sign with uh, fecal leakage and incontinence. I'll then also, while the patient's being examined, assess for any perianal descent or a descended perineum. Um, and what I'm looking for, it's, it's almost as if there's normally a flat sheet looking at the space of the perineum between, the, say, the rectum and the vagina, but in rectal, uh, in perineal descent, there'll be a, a gentle bulge that comes out. And what that implies to me is that the pelvic floor, the puborectalis muscles aren't um, uh, as strong as they ought to be. Um, and it also just shows a bit of global uh, weakness of the pelvic floor. I then ask the patient to strain to try to promote a prolapse in case it's present. Um, and so I get them to bear down and the one that'll exacerbate, uh, exacerbate the descended perineum, but it also would demonstrate a prolapse if it's present because therefore the treatment's entirely different. I have a commode that I get the patients to sit in with. Sometimes that's a little bit more helpful. I get them to strain down um, uh, because it really clearly demonstrates the presence of, um, of prolapse. And then I test the patient's anal sensation because that's quite relevant to the pudendal nerves. <clears throat> if there's a neurological uh, contribution for, um, sorry, contr something contributing towards the uh, anal canal and the uh, sphincters. I then do a PR exam for which the most important thing is to say exclude a mass. 
Um, but I get, a, do, get the patients to do a squeeze test. That means that uh, while inserting my finger, I ask them to bear down and to squeeze. And this is probably one of the easiest and most simple tests just to try to work out how functional is the sphincter. So if they have that um, skeletal muscle control and can, can uh, squeeze down uh, onto my finger, most of the times I find anal manometry and uh, endoanal ultrasound is fairly normal. And some people even advocate that that's the main test you have to do. You don't have to do all the other in, uh, investigations. But um, that squeeze test is important. And then also a sense of the stool um, se uh, sensation to see how firm is the stool, if it's soft or not. Um, I then just assess if there's rectocele or other weaknesses along the rectal canal, uh, the anal canal. And so from that, I then work out well, how to investigate because once that that's the broad history, broad exam, how to then investigate, because that will then work out which treatment options we have. And so firstly, if a, if a patient hasn't had a colonoscopy within two years and they're coming in with incontinence, um, that's either a new diagnosis or that's changed, I'll repeat the colonoscopy. And this is just to look at the colonic mucosa, make sure there's no colitis or proctitis that's contributing, and also make sure there's not a big mass upstream for which the patient's developing, say, overflow diarrhea. I think it's really very relevant to do. And as a surgeon, I think it's worthwhile for us to do it, especially if we're going to be then treating, or if I'm going to be treating the um, incontinence. And so then these other three tests I think are really critical for incontinence. So anal manometry, um, we've just established here on campus and essentially it looks at the ability of patients to sense that they've got a bowel motion and if the reflexes of the pelvis are present. And so specifically the patient's awake and what I do is I insert a balloon that's blown up to a certain pressure that has all transducers that can determine the pressure that's applied to the balloon. And one, I try to work out one when the, uh, when the patient has pain as the balloon's inflated. Uh, can they sense that there's something within the rectum? So that gives information about, can they sense that they're about to pass um, a bowel motion? And there's a specific rectoanal reflex I test for. And so what that does is I inflate the balloon, which would in, tell the body and tell the brain, this sort of senses how good the communication is within the bowel. Um, by inflating the balloon, the bowel wants to sample some of that poo to the anal canal. And so it actually just slightly release, releases the sphincter and so the rectal anal reflex that I test is I basically inflate the balloon and I can see if, yeah, paradoxically, the sphincter relaxes because you would think I'll try to contract to prevent the bowel motion from coming out. And so that's a really good, good test because it gives us some information if we think S and S will work or if they need something else done. I then test the pudendal nerves just to see the functional aspect from a nerve point of view. And then I do preoperative tests um, on the patient. So all this I do. Um, and I think especially uh, as a colorectal person, I think we should be doing these. Um, it's not common, it's not easily obtained in the community. Um, and some people do end on an ultrasound, but to me, if we're going to be doing all the, uh, the subsequent operations, I think it's best for us to do the investigations. Um, and if there's an issue with prolapse, the other test I do is a defecating proctogam, where basically the patient is strained down, pass a bowel motion that's um, after giving them an enema, and then try to see if we can uh, uh, see uh, um, uh, prolapse on a uh, real-time x-ray. <clears throat> that's just because if there's prolapse contributing towards the incontinence, that will also have to be dealt with at some stage. So treatment. So once the diagnosis is made that there's fecal incontinence. There are a lot of simple non-surgical strategies that work all fairly independently of what we found during those tests. And so the simple thing is pads, like I've mentioned, just and that's not training the incontinence in any way, it's just making the people get out into the community and there's new rule pads out there in the pharmacies and whatnot. The plugs which I alluded to, which some pharmacies will store. I always tell patients to, from a diet point of view, avoid clonic stimulants and irritants, so avoid caffeine, avoid alcohol. Um, if there's a gluten intolerance or a dairy intolerance, I'll tell the patients to avoid those. Um, and the main thing which I find is important is to increase the bulking agents, whether it be dietary fibre or then psyllium husks, metamucil, and I gradually will taper this, increasing it. The issue is if you increase this too rapidly, a lot of patients will get bloating and discomfort uh, from an abdominal point of view. But by increasing increasing the bulking agents, it gives the bowel a thickening uh, for which the rectum can hold on to the material for longer. 
And so this is especially important if there's a weak sphincter, not so much when there's the uh, issues with the neurological pathway, but if there's a weak sphincter, it really definitely helps with that. Now, if all those tests show no, nothing sinister, but patients are still struggling with incontinence or they're not tolerating um, uh, the bulking agents or the dietary uh, changes, I often just start on a gentle dose of loperamide, so gastrostop. I start at say one or two tablets a day usually, but this can be increased as needed. It's a difficult one because the risk is that you'll tip someone into almost becoming so constipated that they either get overflow diarrhea or then they start getting issues just related to the constipation. So it's a real gentle tapering. It's a dead trial and error. Just And I think from all this, a lot of the strategies that we're not trying from these to cure the incontinence because that won't, that will rarely happen. But if someone is suffering from say four incontinent episodes per day, these simple things may reduce this to say one. Or if it's you know, five per week, it may get it down to one or two times per week just so that they've got an improvement in their quality of life. Um, Clostridiumine, which is Questran, will, is a bile salt to late. Um, and so it will just try to prevent the biliary causes that can contribute to a looser bowel motion. Sometimes, yeah, it's okay, can be effective. Um, in patients uh, where that doesn't work, we actually give a rectal enema to try to just clear out the rectum. It just bides some time. Um, and this is, can be quite helpful, but just in some select patients. Finally, I've just, well, not finally, this is just for the non-surgical sort of treatment. So I've got the biofeedback in pelvic um, floor physiotherapy. Now, this is helpful when there's a general attenuation of the pelvic floor, but I've found that there's only limited use if there's a frank sphincter defect. Um, biofeedback works when the patients are given a, a, one way of doing this, they'll be given the equivalent of a balloon that's placed rectally, which will give them the sensation of that fecal material, and then they'll be trained to try to then activate their sphincters by activating the skeletal muscles. Now, before going down any surgical option, um, and in keen patients, I'll definitely still be trying doing this for about eight weeks. It's a fairly intense treatment um, that has good results. Um, but the thing is, if there's a big whopping sphincter defect, um, there is, it's not as helpful. To, um, it's more for the other issues that are occurring, especially with just a general attenuation of the pelvic floor. And so if I look at um, just the specifics now, I'm just going through some of the treatments. So after doing the history of the exam, the anorectal physiology, which then I would organize, we'll trial the conservative measures, the diet changes, the medications, um, and either a biofeedback or a physiotherapy program for which I would aim to do that for six weeks, uh, six to eight weeks, pardon me. Now, if that's unsuccessful, there's multiple treatment options. So firstly, if during the ultrasound of the sphincter, there is a defect. So it's either a full thickness de defect or there's a significant circumference involved. I find that most of those patients need something done to the sphincter to actually get improvement of function. So no matter if loperamide is really going to help uh, really get on top of things if there's such a large defect. And so what the options are, are either a sphincter bulking injection, which I do, or a repair of the sphincter. I'm going to go through these shortly. And so a bulking injection is really helpful if there's a specific localised area where there's a weakness. So say, for example, someone's had a tear that's through the sphincter and you can see on endoanalogy now there's a clear defect. Because if we fill that defect with a, um, a special tissue, basically that can restore uh, the sphincter. Sometimes that's not a, a, it won't work if their length is too great or in certain circumstances it just doesn't work. And so then a sphincter repair um, is needed. And so what I do is we, I'll go through this shortly actually. Um, now, if that fails, the sphincter bulking or the sphincter repair, the next step would be a sacral nerve stimulation. And I'm going to go through just how that works shortly. Now, some patients don't want to have the sphincter bulking or they don't want to have a sphincteroplasty because there are some issues with that um, and they want to go straight to a sacral nerve stimulation. And that being if patients just don't want the sphincter manipulated in any way because either they're fearful that we could make it worse or they just don't want something done on, that, on, on the sphincter, then we can go straight to sacral nerve stimulation, which is invasive, is less invasive, pardon me, that we're not affecting the sphincter, but it's still a, a, still a decent procedure. Um, 
Now, um, if there's no sphincter defect, I wouldn't leave an operating on the sphincter referring straight to sacral nerve stimulation. If that fails, then a stoma is sometimes needed, which seems incredibly severe, but if someone's frankly incontinent, it's not improving with the dietary modifications, medications, they've had a sacral nerve stimulation that's not working, but it is just still profoundly incontinent, um, a stoma can be life-changing. We have many patients and we've performed a stoma and no one technically wants a stoma, but also no one wants to be frankly incontinent and it really can give good quality of life back in select patients. I'm not advocating that as a first up, obviously. It's a real last resort. So this is a bowel care pathway just before I go through those specific treatment options. It just goes through the simple process in that it's the first an evaluation of the diagnosis, a trial of medications, trial of dietary modification, a trial of either pelvic floor and via feedback, then a re-evaluation, which I can do or that can be done in the, um, by yourselves. I'm very happy to follow all these patients up because I'll ultimately end up having a relationship with the patients that goes for several years, really trying to optimize things. And then depending on the success of that re-evaluation, um, if things are going well, then we just continue. If not, then we discuss the this, um, sacral nerve stimulation, sphincter repair, the injectables, and there's some other treatments. This is on the right, you can sort of see the, um, the, the bowel history form that I get patients to fill out. And this is really good because it's also good to follow up just to see if there's an improvement because we're really gonna shift away from the mentality of there's a cure and that you have something done and then you're all of a sudden you're completely continent. What we're trying to do is to reduce the incontinence episodes. And if we set those expectations, um, patients seem to, well, we're sort of meeting their, their expectations. If we set those early, if they're expecting to be completely incontinent, I don't think that's always realistic. Okay, so with sphincter bulking, um, the brand and or the material, which is just the acronym PTQ, essentially it's like a silicon sand substrate um, that I inject under a, a general anaesthetic. So we give the patient a gentle general anaesthetic. So it's not a full anaesthetic. It only takes about five minutes. I'll either clinically or through an endoanal ultrasound find out where the defect is and inject this material. It's about five millilitres. And what it does is it causes ingrowth and scarring for where there's a defect. And so I've had patients who had definite incontinence. They had the injection usually within a few, either two months or so the incontinence is profoundly improved just because if there's a big defect, the circular muscle which tries to control the continence, if it's got a big defect there, if we fill that in with this PTQ, it essentially allows the sphincter to properly contract. Um, if you look at the results from using PTQ, it's fairly promising in very select cases. It has to be a really defined defect. And I don't like that they've used the term cure here, but they're sort of saying at six weeks, you can get around 60%. Uh, once you get to two years, it goes out to about 70%, which is what I've sort of found in practice too. And a lot of studies looking at this, and it's always around that 70%. And I don't think cure is the right term. It's just that there's a significant improvement. So that's, it's either, a, it's called sphincter bulking using PTQ, and it's an injection that will cause ingrowth and scarring, and it swells up almost like a silicone. Sphincter repair. So if there's a definite defect that's too great uh, for the injection or just the injection's not appropriate or they failed injection before, um, I would do a sphincter repair. And so this is a day surgery procedure. It's done under general anaesthetic. It can be done acutely when a tear develops, um, but the best results longer term it's done when it's as an elective procedure down the line to sort of deal with incontinence. This is more interfered in the long-term scenario. And essentially it involves me dissecting out the sphincters. If that's the sphincter, fine, there's a defect. I overlap the tissues and would basically suture them together. Um, it's a fairly specialized type of procedure, but very good results. The, the truth is there's very good results in the short term. Really long term, what typically happens is that uh, repair doesn't necessarily hold as strong. So the longer term results aren't as good as uh, short term. I Maybe mean, people will get a, a result, but it just won't be lifelong. And so next is the sacral nerve stimulation. And so I'm a big advocate for this um, because it means if there's a defect or issue down with this, which we don't necessarily have to touch that, we can deal with uh, this, which really is like a pacemaker but for the sphincters and for the rectum. And it was it used to be thought that maybe it worked by causing contraction of the sphincter, but it's more that it improves the neural pathways between the brain, the rectum and the bowel, and the pelvic floor and sphincter. And so 
It's phenomenal in that it's done as a two-stage procedure. So what's firstly done is um, of when the patient's had a general anaesthetic, we find the nerve root that comes out from the third point down on the sacrum, so the S3 nerve root, because this is most closely affected with continence. And the first part of the procedure, and it takes about 30 minutes or so, is that I place... Sorry, this internet's just played up. The first part of the procedure is that I place a guide wire and then a, um, a lead that goes to that sacral nerve root, this S3 nerve root. I place it under in, um, radiology in the operating theatres. And then we do a test right then and there while the patient's asleep to try to see, um, can we see the anal canal and the sphincters contracting? Because that's a good sign we're in the right spot. What we then do is, we then pass the wire out through the skin and then attach it to a little device that you can just sit on the belt um, that the patient wears. And they trial it for two weeks. And then what I get the patients to do is to basically take a history of how it improved their continence is for two weeks. The reason we do this is because we try it's a trial before we place the pacemaker, um, which is a little bit more involved and has, it's a big expense. Um, and so, if they have a significant improvement, and it's really hard to say if, what's the specific value, because it's not that there's a specific value in which we can say you qualify, but it is a point at which their quality of life is improved, and they've definitely got a reduction in the, um, the frequency of incontinence episodes. Then we go to the next stage of the procedure, which I usually would do within two weeks. And I basically change over where the leads come out of the outside of the abdomen, change that over with a pacemaker that's been placed and placed on the back just above uh, where you can feel your iliac crests uh, on the back um, on the opposite side for which the lead's placed. And again, that takes about sort of 30 to 60 minutes. Then what happens after that is, oh, sorry, just going on. After that, I would normally see the patients two weeks later and then it's a really intense program afterwards because with the sacral nerve stimulation, the wires which are placed into the, um, the, the third sacral nerve root have four different electrodes. And so using the device, uh, the pacemaker and the, the device which thinks with the pacemaker, we have all these different programs which try to optimize the use of the four electrodes to improve incontinence. So it's a real, it's a very complex way of uh, that the computers work, but they try to uh, just see where those electrodes are placed along the nerve, which is the best uh, way to it activate those to achieve continence. And now again, get them to keep a bowel regime just to see if there's improvement. Because what I often find is that maybe patients, like I was saying earlier, could have six incontinence episodes a week, they're down to two, to get a reminder that it is a big improvement, six down to two, but it's not necessarily completely continent. But of course we've got patients who are continent, but we likewise have patients who don't have a result. So it's really why well, we've got to closely, closely monitor them. Um, and then I see them regularly for the duration that they keep doing to stim. So we'll see them to begin with every six months to yearly. And that's just to check on stim, check on the continents, check the battery. And what I'm finding is the batteries last about four to seven years, at which point then they can be updated. Um, the life of the battery depends on how effective the leads are, because if you need a, a greater voltage from the battery, you can sometimes go through the batteries a little bit uh, faster. So looking at the results. Uh, Dr. Urquhart, uh, we just have about five minutes left and a few questions okay. that come through. But if you wanted to wrap up some final points. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, well, I guess what I would say is just that yeah, if I, what I find is about 70% of people will have an overall improvement with the sacral nerve stim. Um, and I guess just summarising, sorry to go so long, it was just that one, it's incredibly common. The main point is to start the dialogue in rooms. Um, I would say and really advocate routine questioning in anyone over the age of 40. Um, if someone has incontinence, I think the easiest and simplest thing is to ask them to fill out a three-week journal just so it can really work out how severe it is. And with this, I'm happy to organise all the investigations. I think it's fairly complex, some of the investigations. I think just the presence of incontinence, I'm happy just to try to work them up. And I think any colleague, anyone who sort of deals with this would be too. Yeah. Sorry, but just to keep going so long. That's okay. Um, so we have a few questions that have come through. Uh, the first one is, what is the cause and management of patients having persistent fecal leakage post fistula repair? Yeah, so this is incredibly, there's a few things here. So if there's anal leakage, it's either that the fistula is still present and so that there's discharge that's coming from the external opening of the fistula, or if the fistula has been removed, so it's been excised, in the short term, especially if 
about a third of the sphincters removed, people have some seepage. And so from that, it's either that the fistula is still present and it's discharging from the external opening, or the sphincter is not functioning as well because um, the fibres have been divided or they've been cut out. What I find, especially in the position of some fistulas, especially if they're at the back, so posteriorly at the midline, these little teardrop deformities can develop at the sphincter, just where they've been divided. So it's not that they've necessarily lost a lot of the sphincter, but it's just the shape of the skin at the anal canal is now altered and they get some discharge at this teardrop deformity. So sometimes we need to repair that. Uh, the next question is, can patients with spinal stimulators for incontinence undergo MRI and do they interfere with pacemakers? So they definitely don't interfere with cardiac pacemakers. Um, there are some issues that occur with stimulating them if they have other surgeries, so we have to sometimes turn them off. Um, people can have an MRI, but it just ha it, it, it's not so much though if they're um, having a pelvic MRI because it's in really close proximity, but yes, they can have an MRI. Uh, and the next question is, does Botox have any place in treating sphincter weakness? So we use Botox really commonly, especially with fissures, and we use it to help to relax the sphincter. So if there's a hypertonic sphincter that's preventing the wound, the fissure from healing, we'll inject Botox to try to relax that sphincter and it lasts for three months. So not necessarily for incontinence. There are some conditions um, where the bowel's not fully relaxing because the puborectalis, which is the bottom part of the pelvic floor, is really spasming, in which case we'll give Botox. And that's used if someone can't properly defecate, but it's not for incontinence. So no, I wouldn't, we don't use, routinely use it for, um, for, for incontinence. Uh, we have a few questions that have come through that could apply to either speaker. Would Dr. Lamaro like to come on as well and we can ask questions to both of you? Hello, back again. Um, so the next question uh, I think is for you, Dr. Lamaro, is can younger patients with endometriosis take the pill without breaks for three months at a time to prevent worsening and preserve fertility? Yeah, so that's, and that's, that's often a, a great strategy because if their pain is worse to say so that, you know, the, the pill-free week, um, running it continuously is absolutely fine to do. There's no, there's no physiological benefit to having a, um, a a breakthrough bleed or because remember it's just a pill it's a pill free bleed it's a it's a chemical withdrawal bleed it's not actually anything to do with a true period it's not physiologically better safer etc and it doesn't have any reproductive issue to run continuously and you could run the pill all year or you could run it every three months and three months is about what most of us do because it it, it seems to be the most tolerable without breakthrough bleeding so that, that tends to be a good process. In the younger patient, you often have to start them into it a little bit. So they'll, um, they will they um, will run it for say two months um, initially, and then they'll, they'll, they'll push it across to three months. So it's, it, if you're running continuous, you can just run it until, the, until they get breakthrough. Um, if they get breakthrough early, you can do a few things. You can stop it, or you can, uh, or you can double up on the dose for three days and then go back down to continuous. So there's a few things that you can do to, Make it work, but that's a, that's a great strategy because it, it then gives them you know four periods a year instead of thirteen. So and and, and often that's the that's part of the key management. Great. Uh, the next question is for most postmenopausal women, especially if they've had vaginal deliveries. How effective are pelvic floor exercises and the weights in the vagina that physios often use for fecal incontinence, with no risk factors for other causes such as no prior surgery? Yeah. So. Look, I, I don't have a lot of experience with, I, I don't use, say, vaginal cones and those types of things. Physio, I do a lot of physio. In fact, there's, there's probably no patient that I treat with incontinence or prolapse that doesn't get physio first um, as a first line management because you're going to filter out. If you if you see 100 people with prolapse and incontinence, you're, you're going to filter out, you know, maybe up to half of them with um, conservative managements that, that don't involve surgery or don't involve rings. So, so you want to, you definitely want to offer that. Um, in terms of cones and strengthening, uh, I think that 
most of the results that I've seen with the physios that we work with, um, the, those physios don't don't use cones or vaginal weights. But you know, I can't, I can't say that that's a, a, a bad thing to do because I, I just haven't I haven't worked with um, physios that, that use those. But the results that we've gotten from people that have specialised in pelvic floor units um, doing physiotherapy, they 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 don't use them. They've got other strategies, and the the results are, are often um, very good. They may they may defer or prevent surgery, um, and they and but they also remember that data on doing um, doing physio before surgery. That's very important, regardless. But but uh, the cones themselves, no physio, yes, very important. And and it's I think it's an always um, as long as the patients aren't going somewhere you know, three or four times a week for a year. You want to know, you're, you're going to go to a physio. If they're a good pelvic floor physio, you'll go three or four times. You'll have all the information that you need to um, to put into your own program. And they're doing it at home on their own. Uh, and then you'll know after three months or four months how they're going and you, you reevaluate. The doctor's just uh, followed up as well saying, um, thank you. Does it help fecal incontinence too? How effective is it for fecal incontinence? So I find if the issue is with prolapse that can be really helpful if there's a direct sphincter defect not so much but i think 100 percent, i completely agree with vince that we would always trial that first at least give them a trial for eight weeks because if it is an issue with the pelvic floor that's contributing toward it then it absolutely can get an effect but if it's directly because there's a sphincter defect i find it less effective so if i was to find that there's a major sphincter defect we may trial it but i'd be less optimistic that it's going to improve things Great. Uh, the next question is, uh, are you able to give us some practical examples to advise and do for faecal incontinence in the many female patients who have often delivered vaginally even years before and it is ongoing other than manometry and sacral nerve devices? So this all comes down to the, what we were saying with the lifestyle modifications first. So I find it incredibly helpful to just trying to alter the consistency of the bowel motion. And so that may be that you're increasing the dietary fiber or that you're adding supplements like Metamucil or psyllium husks, because if that bowel motion's thickened, I find that the colonic, the bowel is able to hold on to the motion more. Uh, medications like loperamide can help. They really, you could run the risk, like I was saying before, of the patients can become quite constipated. Um, and then pelvic floor exercises um, in terms of non-surgical options. Um, but if there's a large defect, like in the sphincters, we'd want to know that because if this pelvic floor exercises aren't working, I think that's a good point to not necessarily going to say sacral nerve stimulation, but those injectables that try to bulk up the sphincter, that's really not that invasive. It only takes about five minutes, it's day surgery. And if that can thicken up the sphincter and add some bulk to it, that gives some good effect. So that's different from the sacral nerve stimulation, but that'd be a first point before sacral nerve stim. Great. Uh, the next question is, are there any new medications for treating endometriosis? There, there, the, in terms of, um, there, there was a medication that had been withdrawn recently from, uh, from treatment, but in terms of the meds for, for endometriosis, some of the pills such as say um, Bisan and and um, and um, and Clara um, as a, as a pill as a combined pill tend to have have a profile that may be a little more effective. But I, in my experience, I think it comes down to trying to work out what what um, medication or what group of medications is going to work best for that patient based on their side effect profile or based on some of the contraindications. So I think I think largely the combined pills or high dose progestogenic agents um, have the primary role. There's not there's not really a great um, a great new medication that targets endometriosis in the way that we, we would like in terms of, um, <coughs> of autoimmune um, immunology function. So we're not seeing medications that have been we thought we would have them, but we don't have that type of medication that's at this stage. Great. And the last question we have is, when do you investigate older teenagers with a laparoscopy if dysmenorrhea, uh, that, I hope that's right, despite NSAIDs, uh, NSAIDs and normal transabdominal ultrasound for endometriosis? So 
again, I think you really want to try and avoid a laparoscopy on a young on a young patient. Um, we get to the stage where where we we've tried everything and and we can't, and then and often those patients or the patient and 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 it's often the patient and their mother really requested over time because they're severely troubled by it. But but you, I think if you step through the managements and if you explain, because sometimes they just want to know what the pathology is, they want to know what the diagnosis is. So if you you go through that you know that questionnaire, that pain questionnaire, if you if you're fairly confident, if you're 85% confident of, of a diagnosis, if the patient knows that, sometimes if they can get control of their, their pain, um, then they don't need to take that next step. But if they can't, of course, if, if we've moved through those steps, so the, the non-medical, then, then the anti-inflammatories and paracetamol and those types of things, preemptive um, non-steroidals, then hormonal managements, um, if they're tolerated. And if we've moved right through it and they get nowhere, I think you do have to do a laparoscopy, but you really need to step through it because often if you step into a laparoscopy too early on those young patients, um, I don't I don't think that the treatment's ideal in that situation. Sometimes there are this activity of um, endometriosis that is not as visible in the very young patient that's underneath the peritoneum and it's an evolving process and 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 for them, they've got a very heightened neurological experience from that, from that, um, from that disease process. But it may not be as quite as visible as say that that video we had up earlier, where, where it's very obvious to see everything. So I think you want to try and avoid um, any surgery and any uh, and laparoscopy in that young group. But you've got to move through the steps so that you can, because you can't have them missing school and and missing social life and 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 you know just withdrawing into themselves because of severe pain. But at the same time, you you want to make sure that you've given them the opportunity to respond with non-surgery surgery as well.